you very much, everyone, for coming this morning, despite the, <laughs> the weather challenges. I'm Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at uh, CSIS. And we're very pleased uh, this morning to have uh, two of the most distinguished congressmen uh, who work on the China problem uh, with us today uh, to have a discussion about the congressional viewpoint on uh, U.S.-China relations, and obviously with a particular emphasis on what's been happening over the last week or so uh, with the uh, recent summit between Presidents Xi and Obama. Um, let me introduce first uh, Congressman Bustani. Uh, Charles Bustani, uh, Dr. Charles Bustani, <laughs> also Congressman Bustani, was first elected to Congress in December of 2004. He represents uh, Louisiana's third congressional district, which covers uh, southern Louisiana. He's a member of the House Ways and Means Committee and serves as chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight. And additionally, he sits on the Ways and Means Subcommittees for Trade and Human Resources. Uh, Representative Bustani has been a member of the bipartisan U.S.-China Working Group since 2005 and has served as its Republican co-chair since 2010. The Working Group educates members of Congress on U.S.-China issues uh, through meetings and briefings with academic, business, and political leaders from the U.S. and China. And uh, Congressman uh, Richard Rick Larson uh, also is a co-chair of the Working Group. He is serving his seventh term in the U.S. House of Representatives. He represents the second congressional district of Washington State, which includes portion, uh, portions of, uh, you're going to have to help me on this one, <laughs> Snohomish? <laughs> Snohomish. <laughs> Snohomish, okay. Skagit and Whatcom uh, counties, and all of Island and uh, San Juan counties. Representative Larson serves on the House Armed Services Committee and the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and these committees uh, enable him to focus on the local needs of Northwest Washington. So with that, I think what, what format-wise, what we're going to do today is just have a little bit of a conversation uh, here up, up here with me asking the congressman a few opening questions, and then we'll come out to the audience for uh, a few questions later on. Uh, I think let's start with the, uh, the Xi and Obama summit, and I'll start with you, Congressman Bustani, if that's all right. Um, they finally had their shirt sleeves summit over the weekend, and uh, I just welcome your assessment of the major takeaways from the meeting. And uh, aside from allowing the two of them to kind of build this personal rapport, do you think that the meeting helped advance the discussion on critical issues in the, uh, in the bilateral relationship? Well, I do think it did. And I, I think, uh, first of all, there were no mistakes on either side, which was a good thing. And uh, so that allowed everything to flow very smoothly. Uh, that's the first point I would make, because there have been um, you know, missteps in previous uh, first encounters between our, uh, the uh, leaders of, our, uh, of the two countries. Um, it was designed to be low-key shirt sleeves, which I think was appropriate given how quickly it was put together, uh, you know, coming on the heels of the, the new Chinese leadership just taking, uh, taking seat and getting started. Uh, I think it was an opportunity to not set very, very high expectations, but to sort of allow the two leaders to become acquainted, uh, put some things on the table that will open, uh, be open for discussion going forward. One thing that uh, I think we need to, uh, we both have questions about here in the U.S. and I think in China as well, is what will the U.S.-China dialogue look like going forward? There seems to be discussion, uh, certainly on our side, we're having discussions about uh, the utility of the SNED and what, should it, what could be done to improve it, to update it, to invigorate it. Uh, and I think uh, on the Chinese side there are similar questions. Right, right. Congressman Marston, any thoughts well, on Well, yeah, thanks, Chris. I think, um, could you imagine if this is a, an actual traditional summit? <laughs> um, uh, first off, it wouldn't have happened this June. Probably, they probably wouldn't have gone around it until next June. Good point. Uh, first off. Uh, second, uh, the number of people, I mean, both governments would have to shut down in order to staff this thing at a traditional summit. Um, and the long list of, uh, of what, we, what folks call deliverables would be just one more long list of deliverables. Uh, so I think the format for this first meeting was uh, very helpful. The only quote unquote deliverable uh, was the picture of the two of them walking, you know, without ties and in, in, uh, in, in shirts. Um, that, 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 that was the image I think probably both President Obama and President Xi wanted to deliver that this had more of a feeling of, hey, I'm, I'm home for the weekend, let's get together and talk. Because this relationship has to, if, if we're going to be successful on uh, moving forward on military to military relations, on uh, climate change, on, um, on uh, um, helping, helping China implement uh, its own internal reforms, 
these two leaders have to have a relationship that uh, start that doesn't start across a table um, with uh, with a bunch of staff uh, sitting next to them. Um, the issues are are way too big uh, for that, and it needed to start uh, at a more personal level uh, so that uh, it, you can get to these uh, get to these other issues. Great. Uh, President Xi reportedly spent some time on the first day kind of describing for President Obama the domestic context in China, uh, and in particular some of the economic reforms that they're considering trying to adopt at the third plenum this fall. And of course, President Obama uh, reportedly did the same thing, kind of explaining the domestic economic primarily context here in the United States. I know the, the whole issue of reform in China and the way forward was a focus of your guys' trip when you went in, uh, in January. Where do you think they're going to come out on this this fall? And are you encouraged? Are you optimistic or, or not? Um, my, uh, uh, my personal view is I'm, I'm relatively optimistic. I've got some, I have some caveats. Uh, we've done a report uh, from that trip in January. Um, I know you have it here at CSIS. Uh, I know it's driving all the conversation you have here at CSIS. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, <clears throat> I think that three, three main points about reform uh, in, in China. Uh, one is governance reform and how successful um, President Xi and Premier Li are in implementing uh, what they see as necessary to root out corruption in the, in the Communist Party. Uh, Wang Qishan, who we met with, um, is, uh, we, we met with him in his old capacity because it was not yet March, it was still January. And um, so he um, really couldn't talk too much about his new job, but he did, he did actually end up talking quite a bit about his new job, mm. as it turns out, and uh, invited us back when we go back to, to meet him in his new capacity as well mm -hmm. and get an update on things. Great. But I think that governance reform, governance reform is uh, an important uh, goal that uh, they have to meet. To, if, the, if the Chinese Communist Party is not credible to the people, um, that is going to be a problem for the Chinese Communist Party, not for the people. Uh, second, economic reforms. Uh, we met with uh, Li Wei, um, who helped write the World Bank report, and, and uh, he seemed very clear, and it, sh and it sure seems clear from President Xi's comments, that they're going to move forward on economic reforms, uh, yeah. taking on the SOEs, doing, a, doing some things on uh, interest rate reform, a variety of other things. And then finally, the environment. The report talks about the environment and uh, the obligatory pictures of smog are in our report uh, <laughs> in Beijing. But I, th I want to hand to the State Department on this because it was about a year and a half ago when, when the Chinese government was constantly complaining that uh, the embassy was uh, publishing the uh, air index yeah, in Beijing. The real number. <laughs> the, real, the real number. So we're having, we have, we have lunch with, uh, we're having lunch with uh, General Jing, who's a uh, former PLA uh, Navy uh, Admiral, and now he's uh, with the National People's Congress Foreign Affairs Defense Committee. During lunch, we're talking about the environment. He takes out his um, smartphone and punches up, and he, and he has the um, U.S. Embassy app, app mm. on his own smartphone, and he goes, oh yeah, it's 475 today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, clearly headway has been made uh, with the Chinese government and getting them to recognize that this, uh, this uh, environmental issue is a problem and it's a, a, a public problem. Yeah, I agree. Congressman Patong, anything to add? Well, I, uh, Rick outlined the broad areas and on economic reform, I, I'm sure everybody here is aware of, of the type of shift that China's trying to make to a more consumption-driven uh, economy, moving away from purely an export-driven economy. And there are gonna be serious challenges in, in trying to do that, which means that China has to, to open up uh, on a broad range of services uh, for this growing middle class and meet the expectations of a growing middle class as well as address the issues of wage disparity uh, in their economy uh, as well as rigidity in the, in the labor market because of the uh, HUCO system. So right. I think there are a number of issues that they're going to be faced with um, and uh, also I, I think uh, the issues um, uh, with political reform as you mentioned Rick, uh, especially the corruption issue is, is really important. Uh, we were, you know, we were very interested in, in, um, in furthering, furthering dialogue with Wang Shishan as he takes on this portfolio. Uh, and uh, we'll see how those, those things develop. One of the things that we found in our dealings uh, with Beijing is that a lot of times uh, there will be laws changed, but then the follow through on the implementation is always a challenge. And uh, so as, as the US-China working group 
we will continue to probe and ask these questions as we interact with Chinese leaders and other, others uh, in China uh, to gauge on how pervasive the reforms, you know, wh what's the timing of these reforms, how pervasive are they, uh, and so forth. So uh, many challenges, and, uh, but we look forward to continuing those dialogues. Great. Uh, let's talk about another sort of sensitive issue in the, in the bilateral relationship, and that's Chinese investment in the United States and some of the controversies that have happened there. Uh, the Chinese clearly feel like their companies are being sort of uh, held to a different standard or an unreasonable standard, perhaps, of scrutiny, as witnessed with some of the controversy we saw uh, with the proposed deal uh, to acquire Smithfield uh, by a Chinese company. Uh, but at the same time, it seems that there is sort of more, a w much more welcoming attitude from uh, governors in the, US, in the U.S. states. They're often going on these trade delegations to China and very welcoming of, of investment. Um, how do you view this issue from your seat in Congress, first of all, and then how do your constituents back at home feel about that idea? Important question. And, uh, first of all, let me point out that the U.S.-China Working Group, when it was formed in 2005, was basically uh, the impetus for this was the uproar about the Sinuk uh, Unical uh, deal that was on the table. And when that all kind of fell apart, it created, obviously created an uproar in Congress. And uh, uh, Congressman Larson, Mark Kirk at the time, and I joined in as well as, as one of the first members to join the U.S.-China Working Group, we were concerned about uh, the fact that Congress needs good information about what's going on in China. We need to, to independently assess what's going on. And so this, this type of environment is what stimulated the formation of the U.S.-China Working Group to begin with. Mm. And as we've gone forward, we're continuing to try to, to probe all these questions. I think you're very correct in that governors, mayors seem to have a very strong interest in attracting Chinese investment. Uh, we still have issues that we have to face up here in Washington, obviously, where we're uh, and it's complicated by the fact that we have a lot, of new, a lot of new members in Congress. We've had massive turnover in the last two cycles. So educating members of Congress about the real nature of this relationship, this economic relationship, is really important. Um, one of the things that Rick and I oftentimes do when we have these conversations is, uh, you know, when the Chinese approach us about more direct investment into the U.S., we, t we oftentimes will throw back that, um, well, we need, uh, we need better intellectual property protections on right. your part right. uh, because this creates the suspicion, obviously. And so I think if we can break through that barrier and see some gains, then I think you'll see a, more of an open door in the long run to Chinese direct investment into the U.S. Great. Anything to add, Rick? Uh, yeah, I, I just think that the, the role that states are playing now uh, in attracting uh, investment in, into their states is important. And uh, you're, you are going to see, and you, you do see, and you are going to see um, states, regardless of uh, which party a governor belongs to, uh, going anywhere in the world to attract investment uh, in their states in order to create jobs. Uh, that is a, the, the, one of the fundamental um, roles of a governor, and that is the, uh, uh, helping their, the economy of their state, getting people to work. And so, uh, in a state like Washington State, uh, it's probably a little easier uh, to look to Asia for that kind of investment, um, but uh, it, it certainly would apply to, to any other state. With regards to a congressional perspective, um, for, 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 for good reasons, on very few cases, there is concern from members of Congress about large Chinese investment in the U.S. But for the most part, um, for the most part, very few cases go to CFIUS, the Committee right. on uh, Foreign Investment in the U.S. Very few cases go to CFIUS. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and very few of those cases have been cases involving Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a perspective here. And, and so when I hear from my Chinese uh, friends that uh, it's so tough to invest in the U.S., yeah. it, it, it's, 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 it could be this much CFIUS and this much, you're bad investors. <laughs> uh, so, um, or, or another reason. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not CFIUS that is preventing that investment. Um, there may be people who believe it's, they can't do it because there have been these big cases, but there's, there's, plenty of, there's been plenty of growth in Chinese investment in the U.S. It's still a very small percentage of total foreign investment in the U.S., but it is growing at a much faster rate than much investment, uh, foreign investment in the U.S., and there's plenty more room 
uh, for it in the future. Chris, if I could inject yeah, one, do. one point on that too. Uh, when, when one of the Chinese oil companies, oil and gas companies, took a one-third stake in Chesapeake, right. uh, there was nary a cry about it in Congress. And mm -hmm. so that, that's an indication of a, a general change in attitude. Mm. Great. Uh, just as a brief follow-up for both of you on that, uh, you know, you mentioned the CFIUS process. It, 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 obviously, I think you're right. The Chinese have to have a more realistic attitude or focus on, on what they're doing and improve their, you know, the quality of their investors. Do you think that uh, the USG side on the executive branch should also be doing a better job of sort of publicizing that a lot of this Chinese investment does go through without CFIUS review? Um, and in fact, uh, even the ones that do go through a CFIUS review often do come out the other side. Oh, uh, I, maybe. I don't know if it's the U.S. government's job to to publicize that or not publicize that, yeah. possibly th that they that they could. But uh, um, I think more more importantly, it'd be it'd be helpful if if we all did a better job on on uh, in in the U.S. government of you know showing the numbers and showing the facts right. to the, That's to the Chinese, yeah, right. uh, directly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Then then yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <you're saying> <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Uh, you mentioned the mill-mill cooperation, and I know this is an issue that you pay a lot of attention yeah. to. And I, I, I think both, both presidents seem to show a kind of a renewed emphasis and, and a sense of optimism, I think it's fair to say, about deepening that contact. And I think we would all acknowledge that it is lagged behind the, the political and economic elements of the relationship. Uh, when you go on your trips, I know you always make a point of seeing PLA, you know, mm -hmm. to the degree you're able to do so. Um, Makes what us would very popular <laughs> with, our, with our colleagues. Here. Um, it, what signs would you say you're you're looking for that the relationship is deepening and becoming more real? And then, how would you see uh, that relationship nesting into the administration's overall rebalancing policy? Well, um, first off, with regards to the military to military relationship, uh, I do get my, my assessment is that uh, President Xi is is sending a message to the PLA uh, for whatever reason, uh, but he's sending a message to PLA that uh, it needs to do a better job with its relationship with the U.S. military. Yeah. And um, uh, it's, pr you know, probably have their own interests in mind. I wouldn't expect any country to do anything but in their own interests. Uh, but uh, having said that, it sure seems that she has given that message out, sent that message out to the PLA. And so you hear, um, uh, much less. I mean, just just much much less rhetoric about uh, 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 you know Taiwan, um, for instance, uh, when you talk to to the Chinese uh, PLA. Mm -hmm. Much more um, openness about uh, concerns of, of North Korea. When we met with uh, we met with uh, PLA uh, Deputy General Chief of Staff Chi. Um, he had some very very harsh words about uh, North Korea and the leadership and the new leadership in North Korea and this is in January and um, uh, so I, I think that I think that possibly President Xi is is himself assessing that this relationship as well needs to have a, a more robust military military uh, relationship to go along with all, all these other, uh, you know, the economic and the diplomatic and cultural and, and mm -hmm. various other aspects of the, of the relationship. Mm -hmm. I would agree that the military to military relationship has lagged behind the others, and it's a really important piece uh, that takes concerted effort. Uh, we've seen a lot of ups and downs. You know, I remember when Secretary Gates was denied, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity to visit China. And, uh, Rick and I had actually traveled uh, during that time frame and, and met with uh, General Chun Bing Da and others at, at the PLA. And the U.S.-China Working Group actually played, a, a, I think, an important role in trying to break down some of these barriers, you know, help him, uh, thaw the frost that had occurred. And subsequently, we saw some improved uh, contact. Uh, but at the same time, I think the metrics are, you know, we, we see these starts and stops with high level contact and then it sort of goes dark. And the, the real metrics will be as we, as we see more uh, communication d going down into the lower ranks uh, with, with you know, s some areas where we can define cooperation. I mean, we saw some improvement with the, uh, the deal with, uh, dealing with pi piracy uh, in the Gulf of Aden. And mm -hmm. that, was, that was an opportunity, but as I think as Chinese develop their naval capacity. Uh, we're going to have to really uh, continue to engage. I, I think it would be useful 
if uh, there might be an operational direct line between PACOM and, uh, and, uh, and, and the uh, Chinese uh, military to avoid accidents or mishaps. So I think there's an opportunity at the operational level to have more communication. And those might be metrics that we need to gauge as we go forward. Yeah, let me just drill down on that point a little bit. The, there was some controversy at the uh, Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore when it sort of the Chinese <laughs> revealed that they are now operating in, in the U.S. EEZ in, in both Guam and, and off of Hawaii. Uh, what's your take on that uh, in terms of how that impacts the need for that kind of communication and the relationship between the two navies? Right. I think that clearly indicates that we need to, we have to have better operational uh, communication and um, so I think that uh, President Xi and, and President Obama will need probably need to address that at the highest level to give the directive certainly on the Chinese side so that uh, a process could be put in place and I know we have the um, we have an ongoing dialogue uh, I am drawing the blank on the on the, the title of it at this stage but it's military consultative talks the military maritime consultative, consultative talks yeah, we need right. to look at that arena and see how we can expand what comes out of that into some operational communication to avoid, you know, mishaps. I was going to know. Um, <clears throat> these are this is an important approach, and I imagine someone's going to ask, "Well, what about South China Sea?" And and the point the point I think we're trying to make is that well, what about the South China Sea? You can't even begin to talk <laughs> be, as, as a U.S. and China unless you have some level of relationship first. Otherwise, you just you're you're just playing whack-a-mole um, on on every issue. You have to be we have to have some structure to this conversation uh, between our militaries um, if we're going to address an issue like the South China Sea or anything else that comes up because tomorrow will be something else. So that that, that you know, not so I'm not trying to discount that there are flashpoints because there are flashpoints, but. You have to have a, a, a venue, a structure to be able to talk about these. Otherwise, again, you're just going from one thing to the next, crisis after crisis, with nothing in mind between the two countries, and, and then who knows where that ends up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we can't talk about the bilateral relationship these days without touching on the issue of cyber, obviously uh, <laughs> featured quite prominently at, uh, at the summit. It, it appeared to me that the administration, I think quite rightly, was working pretty hard to keep the discussion pretty tightly focused in the narrow lane of U.S. concerns about intellectual property theft and economic espionage primarily. Um, do you think that's the right tack to take or should it be a broader discussion and then uh, based on, uh, it seemed to me the Chinese largely parried our, our, our pushing on this issue and, and were perhaps even a bit dismissive. Uh, do you think this is something we can make progress with them on, and what are the benchmarks from your perspective of, of how we will be making progress? Well, I think the, I think the issue of uh, economic uh, espionage and, and, th and cyber theft is, of all, of all the cyber issues, uh, is the one that's m most workable, uh, most easily workable, can have uh, initial, <coughs> initial tangible benefits uh, to both countries economically. As a result, I think it's in our it's our, in our interest and it's in China's interest, and China will be able to see that interest very well. Uh, to move beyond that, uh, right now, I think is uh, the we don't we don't have some um, um, how do I put this? Uh, countries can't even agree what it, uh, other countries are doing. Rules of the road uh, right now in terms on the on the cybersecurity side, mm. um, but on espionage, cyber espionage, cyber theft, again a little easier to define. And, uh, and clear interests um, can be shown uh, for both countries to, to move forward on it. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. And um, you know, there's an element of disbelief and denial uh, that we picked up on, obviously, in, in conversations with the Chinese about this. And building the relationship uh, to get to a point where we can talk about this is going to take time and some patience. Um, but on the, on the commercial side of this, intellectual property theft, this is, there's clearly an alignment of uh, Chinese and U.S. interest in this, especially as China moves up the value chain uh, with research and development and the development of intellectual property. But on a broader note, as we're working uh, in Asia in the, in the realm of trade with Trans-Pacific Partnership and other efforts, uh, intellectual property issues are critically important and will be a big part of the, the TPP uh, agreement. And, and so as we walk through this, we want, to, we want to do it in a way that creates a strong agreement that entices 
uh, you know, that, that basically sets up rule of law in the Asian, Asian sphere for trade, but at the same time doesn't push the Chinese away uh, or convinces them that we're, we're, we're looking for containment of some sort. We want them to be a part of this, but it's clearly uh, an alignment of interest if we can get, get the Chinese to work with us on the commercial sphere and dealing with the uh, intellectual property theft. Yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about TPP. It was interesting, you know, about a week before the summit, the Commerce Ministry decided to suggest that, <laughs> that they were studying the issue and looking at it. The Chinese Commerce Minister was part of the small group discussions, obviously. Um, what's your take on, on what might be motivating that, and, and how, do you, how would you foresee us helping them, you know, be part of the process? Well, I think early on, uh, as we were sort of stagnant in the trade arena, uh, the, we, we were having difficulty in, in this commercial relationship with the Chinese. Um, and I think as we first got the South Korean Free Trade Agreement, now moving forward with TPP and a European agreement, which is uh, right behind that, this is creating leverage. And especially with Japan's entry into TPP uh, negotiations along with Mexico and Canada, this has created, I think, more leverage for the United States uh, and, um, and, and continuing to you know, add momentum to get this thing done, but also at the same time creating more enticement for the Chinese to be a part of it. Mm. Now, t time that out with the, uh, the new, new leadership in China, mm -hmm. which wants to get off on a different uh, footing, I, I think that also is a factor in this. Yeah. So um, I think there's an opportunity to take all of these things going on in the trade world and hopefully start to bring them together mm -hmm. uh, to get us back to you know, a more multilateral rules-based system. Um, the other, the other uh, tidbit of information I picked up on is that the Chinese seem to be showing interest in the trade and services agreement, mm. uh, which if they were to move forward with that, that, that I believe would be a big jump start to getting us back uh, to uh, more activity at the WTO. So. Mm. I welcome the opportunities. I, I think this is something we have to continue to, to push, and um, and at the same time, as we go through the negotiations on TPP, be be you know walk that tightrope to ensure that uh, to give assurances to the Chinese government that we're not trying to exclude them. We want them in, but we want a a, a strong agreement. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? Knock me over with a feather <laughs> if the Chinese <laughs> government changes their policy on bilateral trade agreements <laughs> and goes for, with a, goes for a multilateral. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a uh, reason to be skeptical. I, I, one thing that's interesting or one angle that I think might be interesting on that is, is perhaps the int I wonder if the interest in TPP doesn't somewhat mirror, and it's too early I think to tell, but in the, of course in the late 1990s they used the requirements of joining the WTO to help push through some very difficult reforms that they were facing internally and having difficulties pushing through internally. And I wonder if they're not at least thinking about this uh, as an idea for once again having an external cudgel, if you will, that will allow them to do things that are very difficult internally. I think we'll just have to watch and see how that develops, but uh, that'll be interesting to see. Um, what would you say, just maybe you can give us a sense, maybe at the sort of 50,000 foot level of the, the broad legislative agenda that you know relates to China and your guys' views on that and, and, and what you think the key priority pieces of legislation would be? Um, much as as much as President Xi is focused internally on uh, on Chinese people, on their economic health, on his reforms, I think Congress is focused internally. Right. Um, uh, there are a lot of things we haven't got done, uh, and and won't get done, and there are some things we will get done. Uh, but uh, if, if we do anything on China specifically. It'll be you know three lines right. in some obscure section of the foreign operations bill, right. and uh, there may there may be a few few things in the defense um, authorization bill um, as well. Maybe some reporting requirements for the Department of Defense mm. on China. But uh, I, d I just think that that um, most uh, most of what's going to happen from a U.S. China perspective will happen out of the uh, out of the executive branch. Um, largely, uh, because uh, because our focus is you know very internal. I mean, and I don't I don't just mean internal like domestic. I mean like we're Congress is looking. We're looking at ourselves In the right of now. Congress. Yeah, <laughs> looking at, uh, so I mean, what are we? Can we get some things done here? So, yeah. And Charles is one of those guys trying to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I would agree that uh, uh, legislatively we are 
focused on trying to get the bare necessities done. <laughs> but uh, uh, at the same time, I th uh, the U.S.-China Working Group is very much engaged uh, with co conversations with the Department of State, uh, USTR, uh, Department of Defense, and others on you know constructive engagement. How how you know what other things, what uh, other elements could be added into. Uh, a constructive engagement. Uh, we send letters. We have conversations, and um, and you know we're we'll we'll continue to do that as we go forward. And as we pick up on other things, perhaps there may be some some legislative things that could happen. The only other area that might be of interest in, in from a legislative standpoint would be the cybersecurity area, mm -hmm. where there are a number of bills that have been proposed, uh, a number of reports. Uh, some have received uh, a lot of attention, such as the Mandiant report. And looking at, looking at what can the U.S. as a, a whole of government do in the cybersecurity area, which likely would take some legislative, uh, uh, likely require some legislation to, to, to deal with it. So uh, this could be something that comes up legislatively uh, in this Congress, or perhaps you know, the, the legislation could be written and We'll see follow-up in the future Congress on it. But I think this is an area that Congress will have to pay attention to. Hmm. And I would, I, I would note that, that so, something like that uh, would, would uh, you know, sort of vacuum in the issues uh, that, you know, China would bring up or, or other countries would bring up. It wouldn't be necessarily targeted at, at uh, one country. Right. But it's just the fact that right. uh, we need to have stronger cybersecurity legislation uh, yeah. than we ha currently yeah. have. One other point I would make, too, and I mentioned earlier, and I, Rick's talked about it also, is the SNED and what shape will it take next. Um, I don't know if there's a legislative role in that, but uh, I, that's an area that the U.S.-China Working Group is going to be very actively engaged in as we seek input from the Chinese as well as from our uh, executive branch on what should this look like. Uh, we'll, we'll be actively engaged in providing our input as a U.S.-China working group and also educating uh, other members in the House on, um, on the necessity for these types of changes. Great, great. Well, why don't we take some questions uh, right. from the audience. And uh, as always, per standard sort of uh, CSIS policy, please wait for the microphone to come to you and uh, identify yourself uh, when you ask your question. Uh, right up front here. Hi, Chen uh, Weihua, China Daily. Yeah, I want to ask, uh, you know, what's the average knowledge you, you would describe, you know, every congressman about China? I mean, is it possible to educate them about China? What kind of resources you have? I mean, how much have changed since the group, uh, you know, set up after seeing a case? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not American, foreigner, so it's, but it uh, really sounds foreign to me listening to Harry Reid talk about uh, Olympic uniform should be made in USA and you know, China. The other day, some, I think a woman congressman talked about national f US flag should be made in US and not China. You know, I, I don't know, is that the debate in the Congress? Thank you. I, I would argue the average knowledge of a member of Congress about China is equal to the average knowledge of a National People's Congress member <laughs> about the United States. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Uh, the U.S.-China Working Group has 60 members, and uh, we hold briefings, we travel, uh, we meet with uh, Chinese leaders as they come through Washington. But it's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with the rapid turnover, or extensive turnover we've seen in the House of Representatives in the last two cycles, we have a lot of members who uh, don't know much about China, and uh, there's a lot of work to do. And that's, that's one of the prime goals of the U.S.-China Working Group. In the middle here. Good morning, Congressman, Mr. Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Sekero. I'm the president of Sekero's International Group, a USA based organization here in the US, and I'm from Kenya, Africa. While you are talking about China, USA China relationship, at the Congress, how do you look at CLOP, especially now that um, Chinese are all over and going to Africa, America is trying to do business with Africa, Chinese now have taken advantage of Africa, doing good work in Africa. How do you, as a, a USA China um, a working group, how can you comment on trade, looking at your own of the policies and relationship between US, 
China, Africa, and other countries. How do you look at that, and how would you term that into actual dread into business relationship? Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. I, I, I uh, was in Brazil uh, in April. I saw plenty of signs of uh, Chinese investment in Brazil. Uh, I've traveled in some of the African countries, and you know, clearly the Chinese are engaged all over the world right now. Uh, uh, largely buying natural resources uh, to fuel their economy. Um, this just makes the case for more American engagement, in my opinion. And I, I, I did not like the fact that we were sort of stagnant in, in building our trade uh, agenda for a while. And now we're, taking, uh, we're starting to see the, the beginnings of a good trade uh, strategy going forward. I, it makes the case from U.S. engagement in all these areas, South America, Central America, Africa, Asia. And um, I don't like the idea of, a, or the, the use of the term pivot toward Asia. The ne U.S. needs to be engaged everywhere. Uh, and we need to have a comprehensive trade strategy that allows us to do so. Pivot's a great word for basketball. <laughs> um, uh, re re the, a rebalancing uh, is a much more appropriate term because it's not because it's not just a rebalance to Asia, as we as we have withdrawn from Iraq, as we uh, withdraw major combat troops from Afghanistan at the end of next year, we do need to just rebalance um, our engagement throughout the world, uh, and and I'm hopeful that w that we will. I think what we won't find, and Charles has hit on this point, you know, talking trade, trade, trade. Um, we're not going to engage with. Uh, a lot of countries um, as we did in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and as China is doing today mm -hmm. with dollar diplomacy. We're not going to go in and build things for folks directly. Um, it's going to be largely a trade-driven engagement agenda, if it's anything. Um, and there are reasons for that. There are budget reasons for that. Uh, but there are also uh, um, reasons having to do with uh, are we building the right, would, would, we, would we be building the right things? And so for, uh, I, I would just, uh, just caution folks to you know, lower expectations, not about U.S. engagement, but about whether that engagement is going to take the form of, of just foreign aid mm. to build stuff. Because mm. th that isn't, we are not in that business and, and shouldn't be. Um, we didn't do it very well in the, Early part of this, uh, or the mid mid century, last century, and probably and probably won't do it very well in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, how about in the back there? Over to the side there. Just pass it down. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Douglas Kahn with the Kahn Consulting. Um, I have a quick question with regards to TPP. Um, in terms of TPP, do you think China is trending towards meeting this, the standards and regulations that are required to, for China to be involved in TPP, or do you think it's still status quo, or do you think um, they're not really doing what they have to do to meet those standards and regulations? I think we have a long way to go, uh, China, or China has a long way to go to meet the standards that we are laying out. But TPP, uh, you know, I think there have been, what, 17 rounds now of negotiations. Uh, we still have to get through some very difficult issues with the countries that, that are currently involved in this, dealing with state-owned enterprises, intellectual property, trade facilitation. There are, this, is, this is going to be a far-reaching, aggressive agreement, um, but a lot of work remains. But we're going to vigorously pursue it because I, I, this has to be a top priority. I think this is a, a key part of U.S. engagement in the Asia-Pacific region. And, uh, but uh, so the point I made earlier was, let's get a really strong agreement. Let's set a standard for what trade agreements should look like uh, in the 21st century with regard to these issues and, um, and invite China in. And uh, we'll see how it plays out. But uh, it's not going to be easy. But it's got to be a priority. Nothing to add there? <laughs> OK. How about right up here in the front? Hi, my name is Nupur. I'm a graduate student at Seton Hall University. Um, about the military-to-military -military context, China's made no uh, 
China's publicly said that they want, they're trying to build a blue water navy. I was wondering if the U.S.-China working group or either of you have any um, like worries or thoughts about how that might impact future uh, U.S.-China relations. I, I guess I'll start. The first thing I'd say is uh, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it, and there's little the United States can, can do to stop them from doing it. Yeah. So the, uh, um, the, our, our, our attitude should be, well, if, you're, if, if China is going to have uh, a Navy that is working beyond its coast, what advantage does, can that bring to uh, the global commons? Um, and then is China willing to participate in exercises like RIMPAC, and, and can we even invite them? Are there limitations that we have in our own laws that prevent, them, prevent us from even inviting them to uh, uh, um, participate in naval exercises with other countries? But if they're going to do that, there are, there are advantages and benefits that that can bring to the, to the global commons on human, humanitarian assistance, on disaster relief, on piracy, anti-piracy operations. Um, the, so that, that's one box. Another box, though, is uh, why else, what other reasons would China want a Navy? And I think it's very clear. You can, you can literally look at lines on a map, um, depending on who's mapped it. Or dashes. Or dashes, <laughs> or dashes on a map. And, uh, and, make, right. and make fairly accurate assumption, assumptions about um, why China wants, that, wants a, a Navy that, that goes beyond uh, the coastline. Um, in blue water, we think blue water, that's a, that's a term we say in the U.S., and we think blue water, we, when we say that, we think all, all, every bit of blue water in the world. Yeah. I don't think China thinks every bit of blue water in the world. They probably think enough of it, <laughs> uh, of enough of it, that bumps up, into, uh, bumps up to our interests. But uh, um, it, given that it does, then you know, we need to explain to the Chinese, we don't need to be bumping up against interests we don't, on accident. So are you, you know, it's to their advantage to talk and it's our advantage to talk. The other thing I'd say in, in, in closing on this, for my end of things on this question is that we're, um, uh, a few years back we got to visit, uh, well we were in Qingdao, Port of Qingdao and, and uh, we're on a song, got to go on a song class submarine, first members of Congress to do that. Charles was actually the first member of Congress by two feet. <laughs> um, but I have an agreement with Rick that when we get, get on their aircraft carrier, I'm going to let him go first. Thank you. <laughs> or Thank go you. together. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, so, you know, in that sense, we're trying to, you know, I don't know, break, break through some of the barriers and open a hole for others to walk in, if you will. And we are, we are making a request to visit, when we visit China again, to try to get on the Liaoning, the, the aircraft carrier, which will largely be, you know, used as a training carrier. And, but the, the question on carriers has to do with how many, you know, and I've had this conversation with the PLA about how many, and, um, you know, they say, well, how many do you have? We have, we have 11, and, uh, and you guys have one, so how many are you going to have? And the answer is somewhere between one and 11. <laughs> <laughs> Just to follow up real briefly on that, uh, you talked about, you know, the need to, to talk and to avoid bumping into each other and that sort of thing. Do you foresee something like an incidence at sea agreement being a, a fruitful? Uh I, I do. That's fruitful. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you're going to be out uh, on the water, you want to know who's out there too, and you want to know what the rules are if something something happens. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think a, a part of agreement um, a few years ago when Mark Kirk was with the China Working Group here in the House, uh, U.S. House, we went out to. Um, and go be desert to the space launch facility mm -hmm. as well. And again, the first members of Congress to be invited and, and to go, uh, actually I think the first Americans since, since pre-Tiananmen to go uh, to the space launch facility. Um, again, it was an effort for them, for the Chinese to show some transparency, uh, show us what they were doing. And I made this point yesterday, uh, you know, we've got, we have, we have language and law that's, that prevents the NASA and it prevents the Office of Science and Technology Policy from doing any exchange, any conversation, anything with the uh, China, China National Space Agency. Mm. Uh, because somehow that's going to stop the Shenzhou 10 from being <laughs> launched two days ago <laughs> to, the, uh, international, to the Chinese International Space Station. Mm. I mean, our, our, our steps Congress have taken to, <laughs> to, 
to stop China from doing things, has not stopped China from doing things, but it, <laughs> but it sure it as hell, them. <laughs> but it sure as hell has prevented the United States from from um, finding out more right, about what China is doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, uh, back to the point of uh, looking at China's uh, build out of its navy. Uh, this is something that Rick and I have a, a very intense interest in, and it's a natural for China. I mean, China's a trading nation. They're all, you know, they're all over the place now, and, and any nation that's engaged in trade to that extent uh, is going to want to build out their maritime capacity, and so that comes as no surprise. I think the key is, uh, you know, getting this dialogue uh, down from the very top to, op to the operational level in, in some form so that we, we, you know, we know what each other's doing and we prevent mistakes. In the very back, back there. Michael Colopy, ICCI. Uh, since the late 70s, early 80s, when a number of us worked on the Hill, about uh, 25 to 30 percent of members of Congress didn't even have passports. Uh, as we look at the debates now on China, uh, some of us who've paid a lot of attention to this issue and been visiting China for a very long time, wonder if even some of the newer members of Congress, perhaps particularly some of the newer members of Congress, have the knowledge, as you, both, as you facetiously alluded to earlier, that would allow them to play a constructive role in the interests of the United States by learning or understanding more about China's motivation, China's history, and how being, as you have said, invited to join organizations or clubs where the major Western powers made the rules, they may have a strong interest in seeing those rules change, that they may have a strong interest in trying to align interests in ways that are mutually beneficial. Do you think that particularly the newer members of the House have the intellectual capacity or political will <laughs> to understand China sufficiently to recognize what's in the United States' interests in dealing with China's past and current thinking? This is where it's good to be the moderator, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> may not. I have found that if you're, a, if you're a member of a club, you usually have the rights to insult your club members, but if you're not, you probably ought not to do that. Um, so, uh, uh, but I would suggest that um, folks who are elected to Congress bring their interests from their districts. And it's not intellectual capacity or political will as much as why they get elected, What's their district look like? What do they have to do every day to get reelected? Mm. Um, what legislation do they have to get on? What do they need to pay attention to? Mm. And in your first two, four, six years of Congress, that is, it, honestly, it's all consuming. Mm. Now, if you get that, if you get past that point and you get that far, then you, you get a little more freedom, a little more, you have a little more time to, to look at other things, to do some other things. And, um, uh, and that is the, in my assessment, that's one of the biggest hurdles in trying to get the attention of new members on any issue. Because mm. uh, for new members, for, for a lot of folks, it's the first time they're dealing with a U.S.-China relationship. It could be the first time they're dealing with a budget that's $3.8 trillion, <laughs> right? Much less first time they're dealing with education policy because they spent their entire time as a land use commissioner. Right? So it's the it's it's first time for a lot of members. I'll have differences of opinion with members on, uh, on the choices they make on policy. But you have to have a level of understanding, too, about where they're coming from. Because uh, if you don't, you don't even get in the door to talk about US China or anything else. I, I agree with everything Rick just said. And I would just simply add that it is vitally important for US national interests, for Congress, members of Congress, to take a strong interest in foreign policy issues. Uh, I, we have to build the luxury, uh, the capacity to have that luxury, uh, and it takes a couple of elections. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of education of your constituents to do it, but it is vitally important because if, co if we're going to have legitimacy in the long run in our foreign policy, the, the people in our constituencies have to accept it, and those closest to the people are the members of the House. So in particular, I would say it's really important for House members to have knowledge of foreign policy issues. And that's one of the things that motivates me uh, in this effort. OK, I think we've got time for maybe one more. Uh, the young lady right here in the middle. Uh, 
Thank you, Bing Ru Wang with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Um, talking about cybersecurity, um, Edward no Snowden in Hong Kong just um, claimed the U.S. actually hacking China's computer as well. Um, do you feel his accusation legitimate? And also, do you feel this may damage the U.S. image while the U.S. is intensively cl claim China is hacking the U.S. as well? Thank you. Uh, first off, I'd say I, I'm glad the, the U.S. Uh, people think that U.S. has enough of an image that can be damaged. I'm glad it's <laughs> that, at least that high. Uh, second, I've got nothing to say about Edward Snowden. We have plenty of questions, and uh, until some of those questions are answered in the public domain, we cannot speak about it. Okay. Well, <laughs> on that note, please join me in thanking uh, Congressman <laughs> Larson and Bruce Thank, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. No, thank you. Great answers. You guys.